the importance of paying things forward. And mm. what I meant by this is the human relationships that we form, people will, you know, won't remember what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. And I, I do sort of remember, you know, the amount of times where somebody asked for help and say, yeah, I don't know if I can help you, but yes, I will do that. If there is something that I can share, I can help, I can involve people with, because I know that's an area of interest, I will invariably pay, pay that forward. And the sort of social platforms that we've got now makes that so much easier that your reach is just global. Hi, I'm Tracy Lovejoy. And I'm Shannon Lucas. We are the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to empowering Catalyst to create bold, powerful change in the world. This is our podcast, Move, Move Fast, Break, break Shit, shit Burn Out, where we speak with Catalyst executives about ways to successfully lead transformation in large organizations. And today I'm super excited to have Ian Wright with me. Ian is the founder and CEO of the Disruptive Innovators Network. You can understand why he's here today. A forum he established in 2018 for leaders wanting to understand and respond to disruption threats and develop their corporate innovation capabilities. He's worked as a senior leader at the senior executive level as a deputy chief executive and director for the last 20 years, most recently at Housemark for the UK social housing sectors, data and business improvement organization. Welcome, Ian. So good to have you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Shannon, and great to be speaking to all the uh, list uh, executives that are out there. All right. Well, let's start. I'd love to hear you share a little bit about your Catholic journey, maybe a few career highlights that you're proud of that, proud of that help us see your catalytic, catalytic nature. Okay, then. Well, I mean, my journey, um, as I say, started over 40 years ago now. So that was when I came into the world of work. Um, didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, I probably, some people would say, I still don't have a clue. Um, but the journey has been a really interesting one. And, and anybody who's sort of starting out, I would always, you know, say to them, look, please just enjoy the journey as much as the destination. Um, as you go uh, as you go through this as well. So uh, I started off working in the public sector, um, predominantly in what's called the housing sector here in the UK, the affordable housing public sector uh, in the UK and in the US. Um, and I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about people. I learned a lot about the kind of things that can help you in your work environment, the ability to communicate, the ability to empathize, the ability to understand the problem that you're trying to solve. So um, um, I, as I worked in a small council um, here in the UK, the, in the uh, local authority sector. Um, I looked after the housing stock uh, of my local MP um, at the time, uh, Tony Blair. I, I don't know whatever happened to him, but uh, you know that's that's probably for another podcast, I suppose. But. Um, a lot of the things that you learn there, particularly when you're in a front facing part of the business where you are talking directly with clients, customers, consumers, things like that, you really, really learn about what's important. And, and as I say, the way I learned was I made mistakes. Not everything that I did went well. In fact, quite a few things went wrong. Nobody got hurt, I should add. But uh, I was in a position whereby I was doing things that, you know, I thought was in the best interest of people. But it's because I hadn't took time to understand what was the problem I was trying to fix. And that was that was a very, very early lesson that I sort of learned. The second lesson that I learned, and this will fit with um, the whole um, catalyst values, was the importance of paying things forward. And mm -hmm. what I meant by this is the human relationships that we form. People will, you know, won't remember what you say, but they will remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And... I, I do sort of remember, you know, the amount of times where somebody asked for help and say, yeah, I don't know if I can help you, but yes, I will do that. And it's something I've, I've deployed throughout my, my sort of career. If there is something that I can share, I can help, I can involve people with, because I know that's an area of interest, I will invariably pay, pay that forward. And the sort of social platforms that we've got now makes that so much easier that your reach is just global. Uh, and I love people who will say, oh, I was just thinking of you and I saw this video, I saw this document, or would you like to come along to this uh, sort of session around that? So I did that and I built up various membership networks. I suppose it was a natural place for me to go. So I'm, I'm mainly known for building communities of interest. I grow them, I scale them. Um, and that's just basically about providing services for people. So I suppose you would say I was in the service industry. 
um, around that. Um, and then my last sort of real job um, was as a <laughs> deputy CEO. Um, and I retired from that. I say retired. I left because basically I would probably become an unemployable because, um, you know, in the environment which we operate, you, you see that many good examples of good businesses, good cultures and things like that that, um, you know, you don't really have the patience to sort of get involved in things. And and to be honest, I'd probably been asked to, to lead on and deliver too many change or transformation programs. And, you know, a bit like, you know, the work that you'll be involved, you will see a lot of examples of reinventing of the wheel and doing the wrong thing right, a kind of thing. And I just thought, well, look, you know, it's time for somebody else to take over. Uh, and I set up uh, the Disruptive Innovators Network, which was, you know, shamelessly pinched from the uh, Claire Christensen um, research and book. And I thought I would try and help uh, and build a community within my sector. Um, we did that. We're now six years old uh, in, in August this year. Um, and we're now a, a thriving community of, um, of innovators or people who are interested in innovation. So we've set up a subscription of the service model. We've got a nice little community of 100 organizations. In statistical terms, that's about 1.7 million homes, 40% um, of the market here in the UK, which is more than big enough uh, for a man of uh, sort of, you know, my attention span and things like that. So so that's my story. And the, and the journey continues. And I think the one thing I would say is if you are running like yourself, you're running your own business, it is very different to working in a corporate. And, you know, some of the things that you need to pay attention to are just as important, but very, very different to uh, sort of the corporate environment. I haven't written a board paper in, in six years, I see. <laughs> What's a board paper these days? KPIs? What's a KPI? Um, but there are other things that you've got because ultimately you are judged on the service that you give to people. And if you don't deliver value, well, people will leave and suddenly you haven't got a business. Amazing, amazing journey. And I, um, I'm guessing that a lot of our listeners can relate to the yeah how long do i stay in the corporate world where we're reinventing the wheel and having to like bring the patients every day to go through the machinations of driving change in large organizations um so thanks for sharing that and i love the key takeaways uh you know trying making time to figure out what you're really trying to fix and the importance of paying it forward so thanks for those i'd love to understand you know for you what it means like sort of i guess taking a step back how you relate to the concept of catalyst and then how does that being a catalyst support you as an executive i heard some of the challenges what are some of the upsides maybe yeah i mean for, for me for me shannon it is the number one thing anybody who wants to get on in life who wants to sort of make a difference the ability to connect is absolutely the number one thing. Um, and, and my experience around that has always been, um, if you ask. So, so you know, we were ended up talking uh, and doing this uh, podcast because people have connected us uh, and, and brought us together around this. And 90% and of the time when you are wanting to do something or you're wanting some help, if you ask somebody, even if they're a very, very senior leader or a, you know, a chief executive and things like that, if, if you ask in the right way and there is some value in it for them, sometimes even if there isn't value in it for them, they will say yes to you. And I think a lot of people are put off connecting because of that fear of a rejection. Mm. Um, I think once, you know, you know, 10 years ago, once I got to realize, actually, I've been rejected loads and I'm still standing here. It, it almost becomes of, yeah, some people aren't going to want to engage with you, um, but that doesn't stop you asking. And I think from a catalyst executive perspective, it does three things for me. First of all, it provides that, I suppose, that peer network and community, which is really, really important. Nobody, you know, nobody is an island um, and you're not on your own trying to solve the problems. You've got an exceptional resource to tap into. But the third thing is all is the probably the biggest thing in terms of when things aren't going according to plan and, you know, when you are working on your own for a large part of the time, it can become quite challenging. It's that little bit of inspiration to say, yeah, you know what, that, that's exactly what I need and I'm off again kind of thing. Um, so I think for, for me, those are the three elements, the, the inspiration, the community and the resource that when you pull that together, you've got a really, really powerful mix. It's so important. And, um, you know, we are also community builders. So I totally hear you on this level. The Catalyst Leadership Trust is for, you know, Catalyst execs. But when we ask people, the executives, what value they're getting out of it, there's a story that they have to tell to their business to maybe justify the membership or whatever. 
But when they talk about what it means to themselves, having the peer network for the troubleshooting, but also connecting that peer network back into the inspiration, like the catalyst, they're, they're like, I can go other places to get the domain expertise for the title that I am, but there's no place else that I can go to get that juice from the other catalyst executives. And they're like, yeah, you can dream bigger and you can connect dots faster and all of this stuff. Do you see that in your network too? It, absolutely, Shannon. Uh, you know, you think you are unique in terms of trying to solve a problem or come <laughs> up with an issue. Uh, and invariably, you know, now right. we're at the stage whereby, uh, yeah, I've heard that one before. Go and speak to this person over there. They've been there in a situation around that. That's and right. I think, yeah, you know, I think, as I say, this thinking that we've always got to start from scratch, you don't. You know, there are people out there and you will be amazed how people love telling their story of how they actually got there. They just want a, a, an audience and be able to tell, uh, you know, how they got to where they are around this. And I, I think if, if you are a natural sort of community builder, you recognize and you get that importance of paying it forward and sharing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, re it's really powerful stuff. It's really, really powerful. Totally. And um, I've already experienced your generosity, but it's like catalysts also show up with, they're like, I might not have anything to contribute other than I'm excited to help the person in front of me solve that problem. Right. And so that paying it forward and that connection is sometimes a motivator enough by itself. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are, there are people out there who are just natural givers, you know, who don't want anything in return. We don't do with any sort of expectation around that. Um, but equally, you know, if there's something that you've got that's of some value, whether it's a presentation or, you know, just, you know, a, a lender friendly ear, um, people see that as value as well. And I, I think, you know, from, what, from a catalyst sort of perspective, I mean, what, what one of the biggest differences I find between active catalysts and perhaps those who are not quite ready for the journey that is there's a phrase that I use is you know if you don't leave um the harbor you'll never discover new shores nice. and yeah, and I can't remember who I, I sort of um, picked that up from, but it really sort of struck me that, you know, if you want to keep doing what you're always doing, well, just stay close to the shore. Don't take any risks. Don't try and, you know, um, upset anything. But actually, the people who are going to really build something, who are going to find new things, are those who are prepared to just put themselves into that little comfort zone of uncertainty where they don't have the answers for things but actually they've got an aspiration to find out what those answers are 100 percent, and it's so interesting because sort of one of the attributes um from our research that defines catalyst is other people will describe us as being comfortable with risk and ambiguity but often when the catalysts hear that they're like i don't know if that's true but then we'll say you know the one of the catalyst reframes for the organization once they see the vision of change that they need to create is that it's risky not to do this thing right so it's like there's this sensing piece it's like okay i'm in the harbor i could go a bunch of directions but there's a hurricane over here so like let's leave the harbor and get out of the way because it's risky to stay here do you see that in your work uh, absolutely. And, and depending on what sector you're in, uh, you know, you perhaps don't need to leave the harbour to continue to have a, you know, a Fair. good career and a good quality of life. I think I think part of the challenge is for leaders, the further up an organisation you go, um, you can start to exhibit, I suppose, behaviours whereby courage is is sort of um, is is knocked out of you by fear and mm -hmm. by fear of how far you've got to fall. So hang on, it's took me a long time to get to the top of this and I'm in the executive suite and things like that. My word, if I upset the boat here, oh, look how far I've got to go down. And, and particularly when that's tied into some of the hygiene factors that you have, whether it's mortgages, schools, holidays, all of totally. those. Um, it, can, it can take the courage out of you. And I think, yeah. you know, we are still on a journey to understand about how when you get to a top of an organization, you can still think like an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, and you can still exhibit those behaviors because um, people uh, people do what they see you do, not what you say you do. And That's if right. they're still acting cautiously, That's then, right. you know, that your direct reports are more likely to, to mirror what you're doing there. 100% totally. So important. It's a conversation we don't have enough is the sort of financial, you know, impact of being a change maker. But it's a great segue because I'd love to ask you like, so can you share one of one or two of the biggest challenges that you faced as a catalyst exec and what helped you most in overcoming those challenges? 
Um, I suppose my, my, my biggest challenges are ones where um, I had an idea. I thought it was a brilliant idea, but nobody else did. And um, you know what it's like, the challenge you've got between staying the course, but actually pivoting. And it's probably only in the last sort of, you know, six or seven years when uh, I've got to a comfortable state that no matter how much I'm invested and tied into a brilliant idea or a brilliant solution, um, that actually if people don't want it or it's not the right time, and innovation for me is all about timing, it's absolutely all about timing, is that I've now got a much better ability to let it go. Um, and it might be something that I let go for a period of time, it might be something I let go forever and sort of come back to it. So I think one of the key um, things that uh, I, I've learned is that ability to sort of play or pass. Um, and, you know, I'm still learning and it still vexes me if um, I'm not in a position to, to deliver this brilliant event or this brilliant leadership program or things like that. But ultimately, you you only want to be sort of half a page ahead of your of your sort of client base and not a page ahead. And I think this is some 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 things that I've certainly made these mistakes over the years that uh, I'm saying, well, you need to know about this. Um, but actually, they're struggling with the day to day job, and um, it, it's quite hard to sort of get them to do anything more um, more than that. Yes, totally. Uh, th this is it exactly. I mean, this is what we what we teach in the class. I mean, there's a thing that we call like the not right now list. So that's one thing. Like, where you know, to your point, you don't have to let it go. Like, maybe it's just the it's not the right time. But I also love coming back to what you were talking about earlier about like the. Um, the connecting and listening people and trying to figure out what problem you're trying to solve, like what what is going on in the organization that's aligned to what you can help with. I love that. Is there a second one you have? Um, yeah, I, su I suppose um, in, in terms of sort of overcoming challenges, a large part, the biggest part, the biggest issue we sort of come across is that you know this is not a technical issue, right? So technology, as you're, you're aware, it is advancing at such a rapid state everybody's talking about generative AI and how that's going to impact on business. But we fail to understand the importance of organizational culture and particularly people within an organization. Um, and if we do not bring on board the people um, and in a way which makes them feel safe and uh, respected and valued, doesn't matter how good the technological advancements is going to be, it will never take off because people will never pick up and use it. And I've seen too many examples and too many mistakes where that has been the case, that we've got this brilliant solution here, it's gonna transform the customer experience, but you know, colleagues in the business just don't rise to it because they've not been involved with this. And, you know, communication as a leadership skill is just so critical. And I, I've learned this in my course, I've not been the best communicator. And probably people would say I'm, I'm still not. But what I have learned, and again, if I was going to sort of share one, one key skill for catalyst executives out there, which is basically become a storyteller, you know, yeah. techniques, uh, techniques of good storytelling, and the ability to sort of, you know, bring to life what um uh you know what you're trying to do so there's a great saying that you know um data uh, data tells stories sell and i really really sort of believe in that amazing okay i want to go back to the first uh challenge that you shared and i hear that you're you know you you've you've landed on the place where if they don't really want it maybe it's not the right time i love the player pass sort of phrase but that's hard for catalysts when you can see so clearly, like we can feel in our bones, like this is the thing that the organization or whatever has to, the direction that we have to head, the challenge that's coming. How do you know when to, and this connects to your culture one, how do you know when to push just a little bit or socialize a little bit more to maybe bring more people on? Or when do you know that there's just too much signal that it's not the right time? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of this, um, again, can't necessarily be evidence. A lot of this is just sort of good instinct. And again, this is something else that I've learned that, you know, you can spend a lot of time trying to gather data and evidence around things when actually 
as, a, as an introvert, you've got to trust your instincts and you've got to trust your gut to say, actually, does this feel right? Do I understand, you know, what the market space is for this particular business or this particular sort of product? And actually, you know, you've got to want to do it. And I think the the the, the best space for sort of um, catalysts to sort of, I suppose, fish in is, is, is the area where if organisations and people know they need to change but need some help with the how, and it's the how bit that I always sort yes. of find is the sort of the hardest bit because some of that can get quite technical. It's a new skill. So you've got to bring people in. That creates uncertainty. It creates fear. It creates the unknown in terms of how is this sort of going to um, sort of turn out around that. But ultimately, Shannon, um, you have to be in a position whereby you say, I can't convert you. I can't help you. So it's it's not my circus, not my monkeys kind of thing. And you've got to be prepared to walk away from that. And you've got to walk away from hard. I mean, you know, I have a, I have a phrase that which I won't use, obviously, on a, uh, a family friendly podcast like this. But basically, in summary, it's, you know, n- n- never work with idiots because they'll grind you down and they'll beat you with experience. Um, and if people are sapping the energy out of you and you can see that and it's taken out of you, well, that is not good. It's fine to be able to sort of say and say, look, there's different ways. Can I challenge you on that? Can we explore this sort of a bit further? But you do get a feeling whether the corporate antibodies in a business are so strong that no matter what you do when you come in, um, they're just going to overwhelm you. Because, I mean, we did some research um, last year looking at um, the roles of directors of transformation in the in our membership, and what was really interesting was, and there was a, there was a sort of an emerging pattern that came from this that um, organisations would bring in very senior, experienced directors of business transformation, directors of change, quite in, quite often from outside of the sector. You know, had been working at Amazon, Google, Apple, wherever it is, because they wanted some of that magic fairy dust sprinkling on their business. And uh, the scenario went something like this. You first spend the first six months doing some discovery learning, seeing how the business works, looking at some of the processes. Uh, You then present a report to the board and the exec and say, look, this is what we found. Uh, This is what we think sort of needs to be done. These are the big customer pain points. Uh, And the feedback from the organization is, yeah, but that's too big. Let's go for some low hanging fruit. And then when you say, yeah, but this is affecting 10 times as many customers here. Yes, but that's going to involve a lot of disturbance and disruption for a period of time. You know, let's go for something easy around this. Um, And basically what ends up happening is you go and play over there with the the bean bags and the uh, table tennis tables. And, uh, you know, you leave us to carry on running the business because it's going okay. And I think that for me is one of the key signals that, you know, an organization is not right. And and what we found was that after 18 months, these business transformation sort of leaders just got burnt out. Yeah. Um, they, got, they got stressed and they got well-being issues. And eventually they just left. And the organization didn't blame itself. It looked at them. <laughs> they weren't a good uh-huh. fit for us. I'm very personally familiar with that. Yeah, totally. (laughs) And it's, but it's, you know, okay, let's, it's not exactly devil's advocate, but I would like to unpack that because it's like, you know, if you put yourself in the role of the CFO or the CEO or even the CEO, they have to maintain operational excellence. And they're not wrong that potentially the thing that the catalyst that they brought in, the shiny catalyst that they brought in to help with transformation uh, isn't going to do disruption. They, they, if they're successful, there will be some disruption to the business or, or they're not, they're not successful in their remit. So how do you talk about that, uh, or help, uh, executives understand that there is, there can be an equilibrium though, that it doesn't have to be all one way or all the other and help them like navigate that balance. No, I think I think there's a number of things that the, some of the mistakes that we've made when we talk about transformation, we should ban the word of transformation. I see very little transformation in practice, but um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, organizations, yes, you've got to deliver the services to people as, a, as an ongoing thing. But, you know, we make mistakes with transformation programs because we set that a time scale. Or we've got an 18 month transformation program. We've got a 24 month. It's transfer uh, it, the, the reality for me was like that 1980s movie um the jim henson one the never ending story and i don't know about you but i watched the never ending story it was a long movie and i thought that was a good ending but i'm pleased it's over now um and 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 then what struck me was 18 months later we had the never ending story too and if you're working in sort of transformation and you're on the receiving end of this 
you're waiting for these st stories to end so you can get on with how things should be. And I think that's a real challenge for yeah. organizations that, to do it. But to answer your question, basically you need two, pe two teams in an organization. You need a team to manage the past and you need a team to manage the transition to the future. And one starts off very large and the other one starts off small and it then starts to grow and get bigger and bigger. Um, as you move toward that future. But I think sort of, you know, preparing people for, um, you know, business is no, no longer the same. We, we move at too fast a pace now. You are always going to be changing. And I think this is why I sort of like the you know, whole concept of sort of corporate innovation and, and innovation as a skill, as a, as a mindset around this, because, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're not innovating, then you're heading for irrelevance and none of us like being irrelevant. That's true. That is true. It's really hard and we can get marginalized. I mean, it's the, it's really true. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, I love, I, sorry, I'm just, I love what you said about the team managing the past and the team managing the future. And so my, my brain is going a hundred miles an hour. Cause I'm like, Oh, I want to have like an hour long conversation with you about that. Cause there's no magic formula for that. Um, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, what are some interesting org structures that have worked? But I'm going to move us on and maybe maybe we we can co-author an article around that, because that's a fascinating topic. Um, yeah, if, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Hey, well, no, I mean, I was talking good, you know, I mean, again, a lot of the stuff, I mean, a lot of the stuff that you, you, you talk about cast list is, is about research and evidence base and things like that. And again, you know, we're, we're all just sort of learning. And, and, and when I sort of interview chief execs and organizations and look and say, look, you know, you've been, you've brought these consultants in, you brought these experts in, why did it, you were failed to achieve purpose? And I think, you know, the, the, the first thing is understanding, well, what is the purpose you were trying to achieve and being very clear around Around that the second thing is understanding the state the, the position of the organization in your business cycle so as i say innovation That's is right. all about the timing. yeah and if you are in the middle of a big it program and things like that you know you can just overwhelm people and you know we still try and do what we call old map um, you know, old map in a new world kind of thing that we still try and get people to do things that there were 10, 15 years ago. The, the next biggest thing I, I think we need to sort of share with, with, with Catalyst is around the ability to unlearn. So what are you going to unlearn that you've been taught at all of these business mm. schools uh, over the years that actually you're never going to need now? Because in a post-pandemic world, people's expectations have changed. If you remember during COVID and things like that, you know, some organizations were brilliant at pivoting, changing direction, changing operating models and still delivering to customers. You know, uh, there's a great phrase that one of my uh, colleagues, um, Anthony Slumbers have, has, which was which summed up sort of COVID for me, which was uh, around people thought they need, needed shops to go shopping until they realized they didn't because Amazon and Deliveroo and Uber and all of them just right. delivered all of these sort of things. So, so life and business sort of kept kept going on. Um, I think I think one of the challenges, and again, this is just a hypothesis, which I've not fully sort of tested yet, but um, I do believe there's some there's some merit in it, which is the um, uh, the, the the I suppose you know the competency, and, and what I, what I mean by this is that um, organisations are competent enough to stay in business and deliver a service to uh, their customers. Um, but they're not leading edge around this. And uh, the, one of the best examples I, I heard and looked at sort of recently was, um, if you think about the, the QWERTY keyboard, the current keyboard that we use and things like that, you would look, if you were, you know, just looking at that, you know, first time you think, hang on, why, what, we've got an alphabet, why are the letters sort of laid out um, in, 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 that, uh, in that sort of way? And when I was sort of looking into it and listening to the sort of uh, different examples around it, you know, this story came, whether it's 100% true or not, but <laughs> I'll, I'll share it with you, which was basically in, in uh, you know, in days long gone by, you had the typewriters, the typewriters um, uh, were mechanical ones, so they had mechanical rods and arms. The typists became so competent um, that basically they kept jamming the mechanical arms because they were typing so quickly. So the engineers who were brought out to fix the, the typewriters said, we can't keep doing this. So they basically changed the keyboard round to make the typists less efficient 
um, so that the key, but the typewriters weren't actually breaking. And we've stuck with it ever since. And there are actually much, much better ways out there of providing, you know, information data. Now, this might all go with artificial intelligence. You know, keyboards might be irrelevant in the future. But it did <laughs> sort of strike me that actually so, there will be some organizations out there who are part of this competency trap. You know, fascinating. Yeah, I remember hearing that story, but I love it applied to this particular scenario. OK, quickly, because I, I have two more follow up questions. I can't help myself. You mentioned like some companies have been good at the pivot. Like are, are there top three companies that you're like those companies have really crushed the pivot? Um, oh, I don't know about three. The, the one that always comes top of mind. And again, it's a big one. People might not might not sort of like it around that, but it's Microsoft and what the CEO Satya has done, moving the business into, uh, you know, a, a learning culture. Um, and I've, I've heard two or three um, um, examples of his story that he did. We actually had the director of, um, of people, uh, director of uh, organizational development do an hour for us on Microsoft's change program. And it just really, really struck me that particularly, this is particularly hard in a big organization. I see very few examples of, of that large scale change, but moving from a financial sales driven business to a one which is about people, discovery, learning, experimentation, um, I, I think is really, really powerful. So that that would probably be, be such such a know, great example. Totally. And, and it connects back with your earlier point about like you have to probably first focus on the culture because otherwise you'll end up with the QWERTY keyboard thing where it's like <laughs> disempowering you instead of empowering you. Okay. And also just going back to the part of the um, organization on the past, part of the organization on the future, and you talked about timing and the different business models. It's interesting because if people are familiar with an S curve, an S curve sort of demonstrates sort of like, you know, revenue that goes down at the bottom because you're investing, hopefully you hit a good curve and then it starts to decline. And usually when catalysts are brought in, it's because the organization can see that that S curve is at risk of petering out soon. If the catalyst is successful in their job, they may be activating the new S curve before the organization is ready. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have any advice or you've seen anything work in that particular scenario. Um, my, my only sort of, um, I suppose, experience around that is understanding how you do that. And uh, the way that you can't do it is by somebody coming in and tagging on some special projects or, some, mm. or programs to say, right, OK, um, we're going to take you out of your day job for two days a week. Um, and you're going to work on this particular one, uh, this project over here is going to be new, it's exciting and things like that. And every time I've seen that example, two things happen. First of all, you only get half that person because the other half is worried about the the, the the day job that they're getting measured on, they're getting rewarded on. And, you know, if this new project is not that exciting, what it starts to do, it starts to stress people and it starts to sort of burn them out. And I think uh, the, the only way you can build something new is to by taking somebody out of their um, existing role for a period of time, backfill their existing role with consultants, whoever you want, right? Um, and then take them and then give them that sandbox to say, right, okay, these are the problems, make sure these are the right problems we're looking to solve, and then sit down and figure out, you know, some POCs or, you know, ways that we can actually solve those problems, because that's where you will get the creativity, that's where you will get the buy-in from this. Amen. Amen. I'm so with you. Yes. And it's like corporations get so scared. Well, we can't pull them out of the role. I'm like, do you have maternity leave? Do you have paternity leave? Do you have in the US, we call it the FMLA? Like, do you have family medical leave? Like your organization has the capability to have people out for months at a time and still function without that person in the role. So like, why wouldn't you do that? Leverage that capacity to future proof your organization? Yes. All right, thank you for that. I want to get up and cheer more. All right, final fun question. Who is an inspirational catalyst figure for you, past or present, and why? Um, oh, there's, there's so many. I mean, you know, the, the advent of uh, things like the YouTube and, um, you know, podcasts have really opened the world to sort of, you know, to see that lots of other people are doing this sort of thing. So I could go through and name some of the people like, you know, Professor Claire Christensen, who wrote the book on disruptive innovation. I'm a big fan of uh, Rita McGrath. Um, 
uh, Tristan Cromer, all these sort of corporate innovators, or people who've also had really practical um, experience as well. But I'll, I'll give you one one person across from here in the UK. Um, he's just been awarded uh, um, uh, an OBE in the uh, the King's uh, Birthdays Honours list. Um, he's, a, he's a youngish lad called Shamal Easel, um, and he's spe that's spelled C E M A L. E Z E L. Okay, he was in financial services, and um, he was, uh, you know, going to work each day, and he was seeing homeless people on the street, uh, and they were begging, and they didn't have anything, and it really got to him. And what he decided was, say, I'm going to pack my job in, and I'm going to find the solution for this. And the solution is so elegant and so brilliant, and you wish you think, how did I never sort of think of this before? And basically, he found an organisation called Change Please. And where I named it like that was because the people who were he was walking past begging on the street were saying, have you got any change, please? And his model was so simple, Shannon. What he did was he helped, he got funding, he helped these people by um, buying mobile barista vans, putting those vans on the site where they were begging. And instead of people going into um, Starbucks or Costa or for their daily coffee, Basically, they went to the mobile barista and they basically they helped this person change their life around and hence where Change Please came from. And I really like what Shamal has done. He's a really unassuming guy. And, you know, his his model was picked up. So Richard Branson um, voted it, wanted him as his, his entrepreneur of the year. Richard Branson is his, his mentor. Um, and wow. you've got... Uh, yeah, and you've got people like Will I Am giving him awards and supporting him, and he's now coming across to the the US. I think he's he's looking to open Change Please uh, down in, in in California as well. Yeah, I was going to say San Francisco would be a good place to pilot that. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. So, so for me, he is a real catalyst inspiration because he gave up everything. You know, he had a young family and basically he's made a success of it by helping other people. And the key thing from this was, first of all he would ask people for help. But secondly, he understand what his purpose was. And once you understand what your purpose is, there are yes. two, key, like, two key moments in your life, Shannon, the day you're born and the day you find out why. <laughs> Mic drop, Ian. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, we will definitely link to him in the show notes and uh, his, I'm assuming he has a website, so we'll get all of that in there. Uh, Ian, thanks so much. This was an incredible conversation. Your depth of experience and wisdom, I know, will delight our listeners. Well, ho hopefully. Look, I'm just sharing some stories for, from, you know, from an old man who's uh, who's done a couple of things of interest in his life. But look, as I say, keep doing the great work. And as I, say, I look forward to sort of uh, many more podcasts and hopefully meeting some of your um, uh, Catalyst executives as well. I'm more than happy if they want to reach out to me. I love talking to people, as you can probably tell. But thanks very much for the invitation. Amazing. And to our listeners, thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about how to create big, bold, powerful change in the world, be sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break Shit, Burn Out, or go to our website, catalystconstellations.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And of course, if you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send the link their way. Thank you.